Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Ruth Huzzy in Christopher Morley's Parnassus on Wheels on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a charming story by one of America's finest writers, Christopher Morley. It has the intriguing title, Parnassus on Wheels. And as Parnassus was a mountain where the ancient Greeks worshipped the fine arts, you can imagine that almost anything can happen in a story called Parnassus on Wheels. A few writers handle this kind of storytelling exquisitely, and Christopher Morley is among them. He can play with an idea in a rather enchanting way that wins a permanent place in the affection of readers. And I think this is proved by the fact that Parnassus on Wheels, written 30 years ago, is not only as fresh today as it ever was, but is among the very few novels that have never been out of print over such a long period. In this most charming story, we are especially privileged to have as our star tonight that equally charming actress, Ruth Huzzy. And now, Frank Goss, have you a word about Hallmark? There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance. For a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. <laughs> Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Christopher Morley's Parnassus on Wheels, and starring Ruth Huzzy. <laughs> Spring in New England. The time is 1913. The place, Sabine Farm, just outside Redfield. If anybody takes you for granted, it's a brother. I've been Andrew's housekeeper for close to 10 years, since I was 24. I've practically run his farm myself, cooked the meals and done everything to keep things smooth so he wouldn't be disturbed while he was writing those blasted books of his. And then this morning he told me he was going to Europe for a year. And he'd chase around Europe and I, well, I'd do what I'd always done, nothing. A lifetime of doing nothing. Oh, I'd go on with the chores around the farm, feed the chickens and tend the garden day after day. Well, there must be something more than cooking and feeding chickens. <laughs> hey, chick, 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 chick. Hey, chick, 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 chick. Hey, chick, 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 chick. Is this where Andrew McGill lives? Well, it is, but he's not home. I'm his sister. I'll wait if I may, ma'am. You'll probably be wasting your time. He doesn't do much buying from peddlers. Although that's the strangest rig I've seen pull into here. Your wagon looks like an old-fashioned trolley car. Suitable for its purpose, as noted on the side there. R. Mifflin's Traveling Parnassus. Good books for sale. That thing full of books? We lower the sides thusly. And lo... Shelves. Very neat. Here's my card. Take a look at the back. Hmm. Poetry. Well, that's praise too high. Call it a rhymed advertisement. Roger Mifflin's Traveling Parnassus. Worthy friends, my wane doth hold many a book, both new and old. Books, the truest friends of man, fill this rolling caravan. Every kind for every need, so that he who buys may read. What librarian can surpass us? Mifflin's Traveling Parnassus. <laughs> oh, they say a life's the tonic, and that'll do for three doses of sulfur and molasses. Parnassus is a doctor's whole kit and caboodle. I was a teacher till my health broke down. I took this up, and I've been healthy 
more than made expenses, and had the time of my life for seven years. Pegasus, Bach, and I have covered the territory from Florida to Maine. Peg what? And Bach? Pegasus, my horse. Oh. And Bach's well. a terror here you haven't met yet. I named him after Boccaccio to remind me to read the Decameron someday. Oh, well, Andrew will be home later. You can wait if you like. He's a great one for books, probably buy half your stock. Well, I'm selling out Parnassus rig and all. I want to settle down and write a book myself. I thought, who would be the best man to take over Parnassus? The name Andrew McGill lit up in my mind, bright as you like. You better turn off the lights. He'd have more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And he's always going off on journeys, according to his writings. Well, he's going off again, but this van wouldn't do for the trip. Europe, this fall. Well, fall's not here yet. I'll wait around to talk to him. Would you like to look over Parnassus? There's more to it than meets the eye. A man's castle, complete and on wheels. You never hear about women's castles. Huh? All right, I'll look over your Pachisi. Well, it has just about everything. Stove, table and chair, and a bed. Even a pot of geraniums in the window. And all for just $400. Profit, vacation, and adventure all tied up in one neat, inexpensive package. The world's your doorstep, and a bright new road is a waking up present every morning. For a man like Mr. McGill, the perfect thing. A man. No strings, no responsibilities. Even find profit, vacation, and adventure tied up in one neat, inexpensive package. D did you say $400, Mr. Mifflin? And a real bargain. I think so, too. In fact, I'll take it. By the bones of Swinburne, Miss McGill, I can't tell you how much I admire your spunk. Well, since we started out, I've come to admire my spunk, too. But I'm questioning my sanity. I'll spend the day teaching you the business. If later you decide to give it up, you can always sell out and go back to Sabine Farm. Oh, I can just picture the reception I'd get after Andrew reads the note I left and realizes I've gone without so much as a buy or leave. <laughs> he's a man who likes things to go smoothly. He may be set in his ways, but he's still your brother. He'd get over any peeve and... And take me back? Not on your life, because he won't get the chance. I don't intend to go back to Sabine Farm. There's nothing there I want. Oh, stop complaining, Bach. He feels left out of the conversation. He does? Well, usually I'm alone, so I talk to Bach. Fine companion and perfect for a serious talk. He's understanding and never argumentative. And after tomorrow, when I'm selling on my own, will he give me tips? You won't need them. Book selling is kind of like a religion. When the call comes, nothing else matters. Lord, when you sell a man a book, you don't just sell him 12 ounces of paper and glue and ink. You sell him a whole new life. Love and friendship and humor and ships at sea by night. There's all heaven and earth in a book. This wagon is loaded with salvation. Yes, ma'am. Salvation for stunted minds. By the bones of Whitman, this isn't a job. It's a crusade. Oh, well, should I wear a suit of armor? <laughs> Well, oh, there's Mason's Farm around that bend. Since I'm in business, shouldn't I try to sell some of my stock? No time like the present, no place like right here. Got a lift, did you? Well, Mrs. Mason, I've gone into the book business. Oh, this is Mr. Mifflin. I bought out his stock. Oh, go on, Helen. You can't kid me. So help me, Hannah. And we've come to sell you some books. I do believe you mean it. But I bought a whole set of books last year from a book agent. The World's Great Funeral Orations. Twenty volumes. Sam and I ain't finished the first volume yet. Awful uneasy reading. Uh, madam... Funeral orations, uh, bound in sackcloth, I suppose, have their place, but Miss McGill and I have got some real books here. Books more cheerful to beguile your evenings. I see those fine-looking children over there. Surely they'd profit by a good book or two. Hello, Miss McGill. Sam, what do you know? Helen's turned book peddler. No. Afraid so. And doing a very important job, Mr. Mason. A family man owes him to himself to have good books in the house. 
Give those children of yours a few good books and you're starting them on the double-track line to happiness. He's right, Sam. Mm, appears to make sense. We could even get some poems. Remember how excited Evie was when she learned that poem in school? Oh, we've some wonderful books of poetry. Now, what was the name of that? Oh, I liked it so much when she recited it. The Wreck... The Wreck of the Asparagus. That's it. <laughs> You're a good salesman, Mr. Mifflin. You made $2.40 on that transaction at the Masons. I'll be rich in no time. <laughs> Quiet, Bach. He has a tendency to intrude on conversations. I'm afraid I've spoiled him. Now, be patient, Bach. We've days of talks ahead of us. I'm always... What's wrong? You're pale. Well, the man coming toward us from the crossroads, do you see him, too? I do. Uh, that man is my brother, Andrew McGill. Uh, hello, Andrew. Want to buy any books? What on earth is this nonsense, Helen? You've led me the deuce of a chase. And who is this, uh, this person you're driving with? Oh, Andrew, let me introduce Mr. Mifflin. I've bought his caravan. Mr. Mifflin's on his way to Greenbrier, where he takes the train for New York. Oh, pleasure, Mr. McGill. I've admired your Look books. Look here, for Helen, you've no right to do this. You know I can't work unless things go smoothly at the house. No one but you knows how I like things run while I'm busy writing my books. Oh, really, Andrew? You ought to have I... better sense than to go careening about the state with a strolling vagabond. And I should think you owe me something after I... Well, now, see here, Andrew McGill. Anything I owed you, and I can't imagine what it could be, was paid for in full by thousands of loaves of bread and a lot of years. I'm entitled to some courtesy, and I'm old enough to want something more than I've been getting. Now, if you want to buy any books, you can parley with me. And if not, goodbye. You must be crazy. By the bones of Ben Johnson, I had expected to meet a gentleman and, and a man of letters. I see I was mistaken. I tell you, sir, a man who would insult a lady as you have done is a noaf and a cad. And I propose to teach you a lesson. Put up your hands. Why, you cheeky scoundrel! Oh, stop it, both of you. Stop it, do you hear? My heavens. My apologies, Miss McGill. Andrew, your nose is bleeding. Mm, so it is. My handkerchief, sir. Thank you. Now, listen to me. You ought to be ashamed, two grown men. What will you solve with your fists? Oh, every woman dreams of men fighting over her, but oh, not for this reason, and not two middle-aged scarecrows swinging at each other in the middle of a dusty road. Oh, it's a waste of breath talking to you. Go on back to your silly fighting for all I care. I'm going on alone. Giddy up, Pegasus. Before James Hilton returns to the second act of Parnassus on Wheels, starring Ruth Huzzy, I'd like to tell you a story that began centuries ago in China. Picture an aging Chinese gentleman brushing exotic characters onto a vellum scroll. He is wrapped in thought and writes only when he is sure of what he wants to say. For he is recording the wisdom of a lifetime for the guidance of all who seek a good life. Now he nods approvingly at what he has just finished writing. For it says, without knowing the force of words, it is impossible to know men. And the old man signs his name, Confucius. The impression that words make on the minds of men is a force for good, a force for happiness and for peace. It is a means of expressing your fondness to a friend, your sympathy, your appreciation. The people who make Hallmark cards are aware of this. That's why they make it possible for you to choose a greeting card for practically any occasion. Why they offer you an almost unlimited assortment of cards that say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. Next time you have a reason for sending a card to a friend, look for the store that handles Hallmark cards. For Hallmark cards are as satisfying to send as they are to receive. Look for the Hallmark on the back of each card. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Christopher Morley's Parnassus on Wheels, starring Ruth Huzzy. <laughs>
So Helen McGill was off on the great adventure and with no turning back. She had the bookseller's van, Parnassus, and the open road, her high hopes, her unspoken fears, and a faraway future that had no identifying label. Well, Bark, we're on our own. Any comment? <laughs> Move over closer, Bark. I wouldn't want you to miss anything I said to... Well, what's this? His notebook. Oh, I, I shouldn't read it, should I, Bark? It wouldn't be honorable. Well, say something. I need moral support. Well, all right, then. It's your fault, Bark. You should have stopped me. I don't suppose Bach or Peg get lonely, but by the bones of Ben Gunn, I do. Books aren't a substantial world, after all, and every now and then we get hungry for some closer, more human relationships. There are three ingredients in the good life, learning, earning, and, and yearning. A man should be learning as he goes, he should be earning bread for himself and others, and he should be yearning, too. Yearning to know the unknowable. My ideal of a man is the fellow who does handily and well whatever comes to him. If it's writing a book or peeling potatoes, he can put into it the best he has. Even if he's only a bald-headed fool selling books on a country road, he can make an ideal of it. Oh, I can't read any more, Bach. I've no right to peer into his heart. He's a good man, that former owner of yours. Oh, Bach, I feel like I want to cry. Stop barking at that hound, Bark. One bite and we'd have you down to puppy size. Now behave. Hello there. Hello. Where's the professor? Who? The professor, Mr. Milford. Oh, he's on his way to New York, I expect. I bought Parnassus. Mom! Oh, Mom, Parnassus is here, but the professor sold out to a lady. Well, I do declare. Imagine Parnassus turned suffrage. But light and set a while. Well, thanks. I'm Helen McGill. I'm Mrs. Pratt. And this wild Indian is Dick. Mr. Pratt's washing up for supper. You will join us. Thanks. Mr. Mifflin spoke of you and Mr. Pratt. Did he say anything about me? Oh, hush now. Go into the table. <laughs> that kid's sure crazy about the professor. But then, who isn't? Yes. Who isn't? Don't suppose Pa Nassus will seem the same without the professor? No oh, meaning no slight to you, ma'am. We'll still buy books. Oh, I understand, Mr. Pratt. What big shoes that man left for me to step into. He must have friends all the way from Maine to Florida. Friends? Why, ma'am, there ain't a house where he hasn't helped somebody or cheered somebody. And never a word of complaint from him, no matter what. Folks I've talked to just love that man. There's going to be a mite of missing him now he ain't coming back. It's a strange thing. I'm just beginning to realize that Roger... I mean, Mr. Mifflin... sort of bewitches people. He does. He does. <laughs> Fool I am, Bach. Now, now, why didn't I stay overnight at the Pratt's? They couldn't have been nicer, even bought books. But no, no, I had to get stubborn and tell them I wanted to get to Port Vigor tonight. But, Bach, just between us, and I'll hate you if you breed a word of this to anyone, I couldn't stand listening to them praise Roger. Pegasus, now get along now. Oh, by the bones of somebody or other, Pegasus, this is no time to get balky. Now, what in the name of... 
Oh. Oh, no. Thrown a shoe. Well, it's not your fault, Peg, old girl. I'm sorry I misjudged you. Now, Bok, come back here. If I have to spend a night in the woods, I want you close to me. Come on now, Bok. Inside, inside our castle. Uh, in the morning, we'll find somebody who can put a shoe on and... Bok. What was that? Bark! Please, bark! I don't see nobody around. Ain't this a windfall? Yeah. <laughs> the traps is locked. Break it open and we get over to the quarry. Nobody will look for it there. I right, get the horse started. Boy, he's got a bad foot. No, I'll give him a stick to his back. He'll forget about that foot. Oh, I don't know. No, stop yammering. Get on. I got a stick. I'll get him started. You too, uh, Rot. Clear out or I'll shoot. Hey, can you see him? Hey, we ain't done nothing, mister. You heard me. Now move. You think he's got a gun? I'm going to find out. Hey, we just want to show you about the horse's foot. Beat it. I'm going to count three. One. Come on, Mac. Two. Well, if he had a gun, why didn't he show himself? Three. Uh, we're going, mister. Yeah, see, we're getting out. We, we don't want to trouble. We're just passing by. Oh, it's Roger. Professor, oh, thank heaven. Now you bark. So I got to thinking maybe a lone woman selling on the road might need some help. Then you followed me from Greenbrier? After that fight with your brother, I wasn't sure you'd want my company. Well, there's Port Bigger up ahead. You'll be able to get a good hotel room, and in the morning, I'll catch my train for New York. Is that the 10.30 for New York? Sure is. Always gives us a goodbye whistle. Goodbye. Beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. No. I, I was expecting someone to come here this morning, but I guess it doesn't matter. I'll check out now. Bill's all made out. Next time you stop with us, come down a mite earlier. Maybe we'll have excitement like we had today. Fellow arrested and took off to jail right here in the lobby. Well, I'll try not to miss the fun next time. Mm. Ball-headed guy. Built some woman out of 400, they say. Sold her a wagon or something. Oh, it's not possible. Still, wh wh what was the man's name? Don't rightly recall that I heard the name. Fella came from out of town, staying at the other hotel. Just walked in here when they nabbed him. Short, bald, wearing a brown suit, a big smile that makes you feel warm and friendly. He didn't notice the smile, but the rest fits. Where's the jail? Uh, township building, uh, two doors down. Andrew, what are you doing here? I followed you. Well, I haven't got time to talk to you now. Roger's in jail. I know. Well, you can come along if... You, you know. I had him arrested. Now that you're out of jail, Mr. Mifflin, if you want to hit Andrew in the nose again, I certainly won't say a word against it. Go ahead and try I don't guess it would do much good. Oh, Andrew McGill, I do believe you've taken leave of your senses. I need you at the farm. You know that. I can't get any work done. Andrew, I always knew you were selfish, but I never realized how selfish. Roger, I... I don't know what to say to you. I can't apologize enough for what happened. Andrew is my brother, and... and I'm ashamed of him. Nobody needs to apologize to me. That's big of you. Oh, Andrew, shut up. You've missed your train again, Roger. I'll bet you rue the day you ever set eyes on me. I bless that day. You what? Miss McGill, Helen, I'm not rich or handsome or famous, but I love you. I want you to marry me. I can't offer much, but we'll always have Parnassus. We'll travel around with Peg and Bach and preach the love of books and the love of human beings. Helen, will you come with me and... Make me the happiest bookseller in the world. I don't know why I'm crying. I'm such a fool. I've waited 34 years for this moment, and I bawl like a baby. Well, then, then you... Yes, yes, yes. Oh, bless you, Roger, yes. 
Seems to me when a man proposes marriage to a woman, he should have something better to offer than a home on wheels. Oh, nobody asked you. Just to get you two started, I'd be willing to buy that, Parnassus. We can get along. All right, confound it. If you want the straight of it, I want to buy Parnassus. Name your price. Price, Andrew? I wouldn't know how to set a price on Parnassus. Well, that's why it's not for sale. How do you decide the value of a way of life? What is happiness worth? No, Andrew, we won't give up our Parnassus. It's brought us too much that we don't intend to lose. Happiness, each other, a meaning for our existence, and, and yes, a, a crusade. Well, everybody needs his own personal crusade, so he won't dry up inside and become selfish and bitter. Well, you've got to find a kind of Parnassus for yourself. Maybe it won't have wheels and Pegasus and books, but well, that's not important if it suits you. Find it, Andrew. Search for it. No matter how hard you try, the effort's worth it. And your reward will be the happiness Roger and I have found. Well, there's nothing more important in this life. Before James Hilton and Ruth Hussey return, I'm going to do a favor for some little girl you know. I'm going to tell you about a gift to make that little girl very, very happy. It's a hallmark doll of the nations. There's Anne of England, Rita of Brazil, Cowboy Joe, eight of them in all. They're dressed in colorful costumes, have real plumes in their hats, and stand up like real people. They're educational, too, for with each one is a rhymed story of that doll's country. Hallmark Dolls of the Nations cost only 25 cents each, or a dollar for a beautiful collector's album with two dolls already in it. Find Hallmark Dolls of the Nations at the Friendly Store, where you buy Hallmark greeting cards. Here again is James Hilton. I'm sure you'll agree that Christopher Morley wrote a delightful story in Parnassus on Wheels, and that Ruth Hussey has given us her usual fine performance. Miss Hussey, from all of us Hallmark people, a great big bouquet for your appearance in the Playhouse tonight. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Being here did something for me. Getting to know you better has proved that all authors are not as hard to get along with <laughs> as that brother of mine in the play tonight. And it's proved another thing for me, too. Quality is no accident. And when I saw how carefully everyone here in the Playhouse worked to get a perfect performance... I realized why it was that Hallmark greeting cards are so acceptable for every occasion. You Hallmark people must have a tradition of excellence. Thank you, Miss Hussey. We hope we shall always continue to merit that praise. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you all to be with us next week when we present a heartwarming story about a doctor, Catherine Haviland Taylor's The Failure, starring that fine actor, Ward Bond. And the following week, Carl Sandburg's great story of the early life of Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years, starring Gregory Peck. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And tonight's story was adapted for radio by Howard Dimsdale. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Ruth Hussey will soon be co-starred in the Paramount picture of The Great Gatsby. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time when James Hilton returns to present The Failure starring Ward Bond and the following week Carl Sandberg's The Prairie Year starring Gregory Peck. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.